You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. All righty, everyone. Welcome back to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. This is Trevor Wade. I'm the Coonhound Program Manager at UKC. And I'm joined today, as always, by the Director of Hunting Ops, Alan Gingrich. What's going on, Alan? Well, it's a good day. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. We've put some notes together, and, and I'm li- loving the, the topic today. So I've been looking forward to it for a good while. we got a, a good guest that I'm glad we got the chance to connect here. And, and yeah, it's been a good day so far, and I'm, I'm ready to dive into it. Yeah, absolutely, Will. Uh, this is kind of the first time that me and you have done kind of a long form podcast on the road. So it's a little bit different. We got our notes laid out here, but we're on Friday afternoon at Autumn Oaks. Just got the cast called out and we kind of did this uh, for a reason because we were able to to bring on another member that we wanted to to have on for this historical podcast where we kind of celebrate the history of United Kennel Club. And you can't do that uh, without our guest today. And that's Mr. Steve Fielder. What's going on, Steve? Hey, Trevor, I'm doing great, man. Another autumn oaks. What could be bad about it, right? Yeah. yeah so. What about how how many times have you been here? You reckon over the years? <laughs> I don't know, Trev. I, <laughs> I I think Alan and I talked about that maybe earlier at some point. I came to autumn oaks a few times and hunted in it myself when I was probably living and working in West Virginia or Ohio in a career. I had like a ten year career in sales before I went to work at UKC. Yeah. So it was probably during that time period, uh, mostly at Greencastle, yeah. and uh, remember those experiences very well. Absolutely. And in the course of years, I was at UKC, which I think were about 16. Um, maybe that counts my field rep days. I'm not sure, but I did all, you know, all, every year then, of course. That was, yeah. that was a paycheck. So he probably knows how I felt last night whenever you said, uh, instead of doing the podcast with Steve tonight, let's think about tomorrow night. I was thinking, man, after a cast draw, I'm usually drained. That's a <laughs> Friday here at Autumn Oaks is, is when you're sitting on that side of the table can be a little tedious, a long day. It can be, but you know, as it turned out today, it was everything turned out great, really. Very smooth. It really did. So, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of an adrenaline rush, mm-hmm. I think, you know, and I've heard people say that after they were in an event that, you know, the adrenaline was really pumping and all. And then when it was over, you know, they're like exhausted. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, you know, I can remember that feeling. Yeah. You know, you're, you're pumped because you, you know, well, you get caught up in all the crowd yeah. and the excitement of what's going down and all. But in the back of your mind, being in your, your position, you want it to all come down right. Mm-hmm. I mean, you want this to be all it can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And and every guy out there, I loved it today when you asked who, who's uh, at first, the first timers. Time, yeah, first time. Yeah, quite you a know? few hands actually yeah. came up. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I I remember feeling that that rush. Yeah, you absolutely. know, and that's why I kind of said yesterday we talked about maybe doing that, or yeah. maybe early yeah. today. I yeah. said you've just got through calling all the casts and getting all that. You know, I've. If I were you, I'd take a little break. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, man, Steve, yeah. I'm, I'm so happy to have you on. You're, you're uh, set up right beside us here with yeah. the Going to the Dogs podcast. And yeah. I guess real quick, we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, I know when I first took the job at UKC, I was heading uh, back and forth, Michigan to Tennessee. Mm. Every other week I was doing that. And uh, and uh, Houndsman XP podcast back in the right. day with you mm-hmm. and Chris Powell. Yeah, sure. And then you shifted over to the Nightlife Nation or, mm-hmm. uh, stuff. And then... Uh, and now we're going to the Dog Podcast 100 episode you just dropped. We so. just did the 100th last, the one that's playing this week as we're talking. You're an expert it's in this game now. Oh, brother. It's hard for me to believe. I think there's been like 211 or something like that podcast wow. that I've done now. Yeah. That blows my mind. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I remember when Chris Powell and I first got together, started talking about it. I'll be honest with you. I had heard about podcasts. Uh, Ron Beam, I think. Bain. Pat Ron Bain, Bain yeah. Bain. He From called Michigan. me one time and mm-hmm. asked me if I'd like to be on a podcast. And I said, yeah, I don't know what that is, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I was really pretty dumb. And then, you know, Chris was a podcast listener. 
So he'd been listening to Joe Rogan and media and some of these things. And so, you know, he kind of led me into that a little bit, but we were both green as grass. We knew nothing about equipment or, you know, how to, what's an RSS feed? How do we get this thing on the internet and all? So I was a, a real rookie in those days. Yeah. And I remember sitting on a sofa at the house with the TV tray sitting in front of me with a mic on it doing, you know, doing my thing, man. I'm, yeah. <laughs> but don't want to overpower the, these answers, but I always thought having a radio show would be the coolest thing. I was going to mention that because I've heard you say that a lot throughout the years, you know, mention that, that Ben, this is kind of better than that. Isn't it, it is better. It <laughs> really is. And you don't have all the hassle. Because, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, man, I'm going to have a radio show, and it's going to be every Sunday night, and I'm going to have all the results of all the events for the yeah. weekend. And I'm thinking, you dummy, <laughs> you don't, you're a party of one. Yeah. Who's going to feed you all this information? Yeah. How are you going to get stations to carry your show? Yeah. You're going to get it syndicated? Well, anyway. Well, but, it's kind of cool we're talking about this, really, because we're going to dive way back in to where they would have never even dreamed of anything like this, you know, and, right. and to the simple beginnings of night hunts. And yeah. and it's it's I think it's going to be hopefully we can kind of paint that picture of what it looked like, you know, yeah. back in the day and kind of how things have evolved. And, mm. and uh, you know, we're yeah. talking about today's, you know, what the technology and everything we have available today, but. Things looked a whole lot different going back to some of the first night hunts, for sure. Oh, I guess. And, you know, this media thing, I'm thinking, as you're talking, that we, you know, there, there was nothing. Back in the very earliest days, you had somehow somebody calling in from a cast. And I don't even think cell phones were available. I think it was a walkie-talkie or something. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody relayed it or yeah. what in, into the headquarters that yeah. so-and-so was leading the cast, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then, you know, from that it progressed. Along came the Internet, and we started doing play-by-plays, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, man, I have so mem many memories of all of that and just so thankful to have been a a part of seeing some of that develop, you know, because back in the days of UKC when we started having wanted a message for them and all those things, yeah. you know, how do you do that? Sure. You know, the internet was so new mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all. And yeah. so it, we've come a ways. Yeah, come a long ways. ways. Long yeah. ways, so. Well, you, you kind of alluded to it there, Alan, and, and in the introduction there we did. Uh, this Just coming here real quick, when, by the time you listen to this, it'll be in the next couple of days, the 70th year anniversary of UKC Lawson's Night Hunt events. Sept 70 years. September 18th, 1953. And uh, we're going to talk about that day. We're going to look back at uh, the scorecard they had at that first event. We're going to look at some of the results from that event. We're going to talk about a lot of people, a lot of names and dogs that people are probably familiar with. Uh, but let's talk a little bit first about how, how we got to that point and, uh, and working at UKC. And I know both of you guys know this. There's a wealth of resources at, at our fingertips always with our old uh, publications and uh, see the 100-year centennial books in front of Allen where we've pulled some really good articles from the past uh, that you can reference. And I used all those things when kind of digging up small things. And, Steve, I'm glad you're on here. One of the, th the first things that I saw was the September 1983 issue of Coonhound Bloodlines. Uh, and that was the 30th year anniversary of uh, night hunts, and that was that uh, that that issue. And you were a big time com contributor to that issue, and I got a lot of information from that <laughs> issue. 1983. That was probably pretty early in your tenure. It was really. I came to work there uh, in uh, Jan on January 3rd, 83. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think that was you know we there were so many things happening at that time starting to build Coonham Bloodlines magazine and starting the breed issues and things like that. So I did a lot of writing back in those days. And really, I had done no writing. I'd submitted a, an article or two to Full Crime magazine when, back in 71. Yeah. I think the first published article I had was 1971. And I was in Japan in the Air Force. Yeah. And, you know, and I wrote, but when I got to UKC, uh, then President Fred Miller told me, well, we have this column or article called Coon Talk. And it was been written by uh, Andy Johnson, who was there, was kind of my predecessor. 
And so now this is your baby. So mm-hmm. you, you need to write this every month, you know. Mm-hmm. I said, well, okay. Well, here we go. You know, but as <laughs> So that got, was kind of your first writing? That yeah. was really on a regular basis, oh. yes. Huh. That was uh, the thing. I, I always read in everything I could get my hands mm-hmm. on. And, and so a, a lot of that history I had already digested through my dad's magazines yeah. and stuff yeah. when I was home. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think uh, for us to get to that point in uh, in 1953 with that first license night home, we kind of have to start out with the field trials. That's kind of right. the basis of of people wanting to compete with with coon hounds, um, in a way. And uh, and in those articles, it tells you that uh, the first publicized field trial was back in Marion, Ohio, back in 1924. Mm. And uh, mm-hmm. there was a picture in the magazine of a blue tick colored <laughs> hound by the name of Bones. Bones, uh, owned That's by right. Lester Harry Hartman, right? Oh, Hartman. Was yeah, Hartman, Hartman the one? on there. Yeah. There was one name, a fellow named Robinson, also that owned. I got you. He, uh, yeah, that one of those big uh, field trial dogs. Yeah, yeah. You you alluded to a few different ones in that in that article, but that picture there of bones and he was, he was looked like a hound that you would see in the hunts today. Honestly, oh, I mean, yeah. his, mm-hmm. his, uh, confirmation and, and the way he was built, he wasn't one of the long ears, slower type. He looked like a fit coon hound that you'd see competing at an event like this. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 1924. That's, you know, my grandfather yeah. was my hero when it came to coon hounds and beagles and stuff. And this is even before his time. That's just hard for me to fathom. My dad was born in 1920 and, uh, you know, as you go back into those old magazines and when I started doing research for like that 30 years of hunting and doing these breed issues, went back there. Those were the days when guys wore their straw hats, straw bowler hats and their suits and or coats yeah. and ties. Yeah. And they got all the dogs together that were in the field trial mm-hmm. out there and they had a big photo and, and they painted the numbers on the dog's side. And those guys, that was pre-registration, you know, for a lot of those dogs. Yeah. Uh, UKC, I think, 1898 yeah. was the first year. It was. But they still, you know, there was uh, some swagger there. They had, had yeah. some events, you know. But I think those guys soon started thinking, you know, this is fun. We love it. But it's really not like the hunt. I, I want to go out and beat you with my dog in the woods. Right. You know, but they had some great names for their dogs, like Bones, Midnight Flyer. Yeah, well, I remember that was, seeing that, was that a name. Red Dog, man. Yeah, you know, and they, they there was a Colonel Robinson. That name keeps coming back to my yeah. mind. He was one of those early field trialers, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, uh, but yeah, and those dogs, those field trial dogs, when the uh, the night hunt started, the first slice and stuff, they figured pretty strongly, mm-hmm. you know. They did? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You uh, know, you mentioned that field trial was in Marion, Ohio. Ironically, that is uh, right next town over from Mount Gilead, Ohio, where a world championship right? was this year. So we kind of know where that is. Yeah. yeah. You know, when yeah. we go over there to the world hunt, you know, we'll, we'll go right, right through there. We might stay We might stay yeah, right there. Well, yeah. It, well, yeah. I, I guess we have to we have to mention the the leafy oak. We can't be at Autumn Oaks and not mention the leafy See, oak, I re, which started I re, three years later. Yeah, three years, nineteen twenty seven. I think they're the Kenton National or right. leafy oak. And yeah. I remember my grandfather talking about the leafy oak. And honestly, at the time when he was talking about, it, I already heard a little bit about the Autumn Oaks. Yeah, or yeah. as old Charlie Cundiff calls it, the Autumn Oak. Yeah, you know, well, but I friend, thought he was talking about the same thing, but it really wasn't. Well, this Le- was a Lee event. Kearns, my good friend from South Carolina. Lee just had his 84th birthday. Wow. Lee's quite a great guy to talk to because he hunted with some of the real famous dogs that we talk about yeah. in the Walker breed, especially mm-hmm. Banjo 2, House's Lipper, yeah. um, Go, uh, Gold Creek Mundo, yeah. all these dogs. He actually hunted with those dogs and bred to them. But Lee calls it Autumn's Oak. Oh, Autumn's Oak. Autumn's Oak. Yeah. Put yeah. a little long <laughs> spin on it, don't they? <laughs> You know, I mentioned Charlie Cundiff always called it the Autumn Oak, and, and yeah, his right. his son Doug is a field rep for us, and he right. that's what how he still calls it, you know, the Autumn Oak. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, you you kind of talked about this a little bit, Steve, but already by the uh, probably in the twenties already, but definitely in the thirties, the the field trial stuff was kind of uh, <laughs> was kind of already uh, not being well received by the coon by the the true coon hunters of that time. 
uh, just a lot of issues. And uh, there was one excerpt in the in the magazine that I saw come from a, an ad. Hans Wagner, that's probably a name that's familiar oh, to yeah. a lot of uh, black and tan fanciers for sure. And his Midnight Melody Coonhound Kennels. And there's an ad back in the 1930s. And I'm just going to read a, a quote on on his ad uh, of him and, and what he th- and and you can kind of uh, see how I would say hit this opinion was shared by a lot of the true coon hunters at the time. It says we have always bred the best of the best, and by this we mean genuine old coon hounds that have won their spurs out in the big woods and water country, treeing wild coons in all kinds of rough weather. Not mongrels that have won their championships over a Tom Thumb golf course on a warm <laughs> Sunday afternoon running a 20-minute old coon drag, which any parlor poodle can do, as is evident by many of the great field trial champions. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you, you, uh, you quoted it, and then afterwards you said, the battle, on, the battle lines were drawn. <laughs> <laughs> the gloves were off, <laughs> yeah. for sure. Hans Wagner was a really colorful guy. He was an uh, a window dresser. Mm. He would do, back in the old days in the towns, you know, you went down the street and you window shopped in the, in the new clothing lines that came out of new furniture and all that stuff were placed in the windows for people walking by to see. And that was his job. So, and, and he must have done some advertising writing too. Yeah. And he's the guy that we really accredit for today's type of black and tan, the, what we, they call the medium eared black mm-hmm. and tan. Yeah. But he was quite the advertiser, man. And I, you would read those ads, and he would be on a camp hunt on that, those rough bluffs in Iowa along the river. And, you know, and he could really paint a picture, yeah. a word picture. Yeah. So he was a real leader, a Absolutely. pioneer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, call them parlor poodles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wasn't gonna. He wasn't beating around the bush much, was he? No, no, no. he's letting it be known. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but you did make a good point, and and I think that it, it's true. And you kind of talked to you kind of mentioned it uh, without probably even noticing it. But uh, we talk about these these field trial dogs. They're this certain style of dog, and then there's also these uh, the the typical coon hounds of those days with the long ears and, mm-hmm. and you know the bugle mouth and everything but whenever you combine those two together and people are working towards uh you can kind of get a pretty good coon dog and i think that's kind of what happened uh when you when you're you're breeding those kind of two things together you, you got here many coon hunters had the mm-hmm. long-eared bugle voice cold trailing walking type of coon hound and the field trialers had the trimmer built racy type of hound that would cover the course in the fastest time and uh, good commercial breeders at that time were able to meld those two types together, and they were able to have pr- pretty successful lines by doing this. I think that's exactly what happened, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, the the black and tan, of course, was, you know, the old standard coon hound, you know, and they were called, a lot of them, people called them sky lookers, you know, because they would take a couple steps and smell that coon scent, and they'd stop throw their head straight their out head and lift, toward the moon the they let out a big ball and then they you know down to the ground they'd go again and s- make a few more sniffs <laughs> but <laughs> they weren't they weren't ambush dogs were they no they, were, <laughs> they didn't have many ambush dogs then. not at all but you know those dogs they kind of progressed with the pioneers you know across the country and the midwest became a big hotbed for all this this field trial activity and all, uh, you know, there was an event called the Transippi, and you find that in history as a big field trial. Mm-hmm. There, you know, and and then of course the Kenton you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, Kenton National, which was actually the predecessor to the, the leafy, leafy oak. oak, yeah, and uh, and then of course the good folks at UKC decided to, that. Leafy Oak was more of a, I may be jumping ahead, but little was more of a field trial and water race and all. We want something for the coon hunters, the guys yeah. that want to compete, you know. And, yeah. and yeah. I think they cool. had a lot of things going on at the Leafy Oak or the Kenton. <laughs> oh, <National>. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, it wasn't, a, it, it wasn't a place, it wasn't, let's put it this way, it wasn't the ideal family vacation. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, well, we are going to jump ahead a little bit. We, you know, we've we've talked about the uh, the inception of the field trials. We've gone through the '30s a little bit, but let's get to the the mid 1940s, and that's when things really start to pick up. 
And I'm trying to imagine working for for United Kennel Club at this time. You know, you, you right at at this time in 1946, you we recognize three breeds. UKC does. You got the black and tans, the red bones, and the English. And uh, right here in the, in the, just a short time frame, uh, you, you get a few more on board. In, in 1945, the Tree and Walker Coonhound breed branches from the English Coonhound breed. The Blue Tick Coonhounds branch from the English Coonhounds as well. And then the the plot hound, your uh, your breed of choice is uh, is recognized as a breed in 1946, and that's all all happening at once. And while that's going on, uh, there's a real push for for uh, for a different style of coon hunt at this time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that and in that in 1946 is the year there was a, a meeting and hunt held in Wycliffe, Kentucky, and uh, and the and. The history books would tell you that's kind of where the first seed of where uh, today's night hunts come from was from this meeting, and uh, and we've talked about it a little bit. We we've, we've talked about the good things that the field trials did for coon hounds and progressing them, but there were also some downsides to it, and uh, and a lot of the coon hunters weren't happy because uh, people were kind of going away from coon hounds in these field trials, and they were using more of a, mm-hmm. a sight hound type dog mm-hmm. that was more based on speed than any sort of yeah. sending or or hunting yeah, ability. Yeah. Kind of mixed up dogs with greyhounds, whippets, and exactly. dogs like that for you know trying right. to build that speed. Yeah. You know, I speed was probably more important than anything really for the most part. Oh yeah, there was yeah a, absolutely. And there was a lot of greyhound influence, as you said, Trevor. And I remember the first field trial I went to with my father, and I wrote about it in my book. That you know we were standing on this hill, and we were standing near the home tree where the dogs would, and they would have to come up over this hill. And then there was like about a 50-yard dash to the home tree. And, you know, these dogs come up over the hill, and they're these greyhound-type dogs. And, and, you know, and they're flying, and a lot of them run clear past the tree yeah. and all. And <laughs> in the distance, you can hear this, oh. <laughs> and I'm listening, and and just a little bit, and these other dogs now, they come back to the tree and they're jumping up and down and here come these two long-eared old-fashioned black and tans right up over that hill right on that track and they're working it mm-hmm. and right in oh and right into that tree sit down throw their heads back and tree you know yeah. and, and that was a, the contrast yeah. there you know, of the two types. Yeah, and you, you mentioned uh, jumping up on the tree. And a lot of the old pictures you see of dogs treeing, they are up off the ground like that. Uh, yeah. You see a lot of pictures like that. Yeah. I but, think it was the type of dog maybe, and they, they were so excited to yeah. see that lure. And back in those days, I, I think most of them were actually used a live raccoon in a cage, which we don't yeah. do now. Mm-hmm. But, uh Yeah. But that was one of my first experiences with that, yeah. you know, the two types of dogs right there. You know, I got the, yeah. got the full picture. <laughs> yeah. You got a, you got a front row seat to that one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there were some real influ- uh, going back to the meeting, there was uh, some real influential people there. And there probably a few guys that we're going to mention over and over in this, in this podcast, a couple of names mentioned were Brooks McGill, mm-hmm. Sam Hawkins, Manfred Craver, Archie Weir, Burl Fruits, And it says about 15 other interested hunters. And this group met together in Tupelo, Mississippi, and they actually uh, had a little name for themselves called the American Coon Hunters Association. I think a lot of people will be familiar mm-hmm. with that name mm-hmm. even today. A C H A. A C H A. Yep, A C H A. You know, and you're right. Brooks McGill is a name. Manford Craven and or uh, Craver and Brooks McGill are two names that were yeah. they're just synonymous to this right. sport. And they were both uh, red bone fanciers. Yep. And the other name that comes in, Robert Graves, yep. comes in through the Alabama mm-hmm. side. See, there was a group at Columbia or at Alexander City, and and I would imagine from that account, Trevor, that those fifteen others or so probably included right. Robert Graves, yep. sure. John Carter, yep. some of the people that I was fortunate. I did. I never met Robert Graves. Yeah. His daughter was Manfred Craver's wife. Okay. Oh, okay. So there was a connection that. there. Manfred Craver, we would take just a second, yeah. was the manager of Autumn Oaks for many years. Good. Manfred was a very astute guy. I mean, he, he was a buttoned-up guy. You mm-hmm. know, he wore a tie and a jacket, a little fedora hat usually, and he was a student of, of the rules. 
In fact, he wrote the first Rules yeah, Corner articles. Oh, nice. A super nice guy and was on staff as a field rep mm. when I first became a field rep. Wow. So, so you, Manford, you knew him personally? I knew Ma Manford personally, and I can tell you that the prior president of, of UKC, Fred Miller, highly revered Manford Craver. Mm. When Manford passed away, Fred drove from Kalamazoo to Greencastle, Indiana, you know, to attend Manford's uh, funeral mm -hmm. and really thought, of, but Manford was just a special guy. Yeah. He was a real special yeah. guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's interesting. It's pretty neat that that's somebody that you would have known personally. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing down through the years that people used to ask me about the rules, and you guys are now interpreting those rules, and they change periodically and all. But I could always say, you know, well, and they'd say, well, why is this rule like this or that? And I could remember the rules committee meetings and, and sitting the intent, there the and intent, listening. Yeah. yeah, the intent behind mm -hmm. the rule. Mm -hmm. And that helped me a it lot. Mm -hmm. and, and Manford was that kind of guy. He had been there when the darn things were written <laughs> the first yeah. time around. So he knew, you know, and uh, that's... Do you think, you know, going back to that, speaking of writing rules, did were those guys good at how they wrote those rules to be able to interpret them in the way they were intended? You know, that's, that's a good question, Alan. And I can recall, and I don't know, I guess I've kind of been gifted, and I don't want to say that smugly at all, but gifted with editing things yeah. that didn't sound quite right. Mm -hmm. And I remember all those years on Roos Committee, the Roos Committee members would sit around that big boardroom table at UKC and go over the entire scorecard on a single weekend. And they, someone would present a rule change and they'd throw it out there and the language would be real tricky. It'd be a lot of unclear meaning and stuff, you know? And so I, I kind of assumed the role of sitting back and listening to the discussions and all when everybody had their say and say, hey, guys, I hear what you're saying. What if you said it this way? Mm -hmm. Would that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't always agree, but in most cases, mm -hmm. they said, yeah, you know. So there was a time when I was at UKC that I went back over the field trial, water race, all those rules, and kind of tried to clear up those vague yeah. things, you know. But... Uh, no, I think they did a pretty good job, you know, they were. Well, I know in today's, you know, today we do kind of pine over things like that to make mm -hmm. sure we try to write them in a way oh, that yeah. is, is understood as it was and intended. And you do a great job. You do. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, you just wonder about when they first wrote those first rules, you know, yeah. and that uh, if they came across the way they were intended. Mm -hmm. But, Yeah. Well, when I spoke with John Carter, who was part of that. you That's somebody that you also met. You went yeah. to his house, did you not? Met him. I was he was in Alabama? Alabama, Georgia, Alabama. In Shorter, Alabama, near Montgomery. And through his son-in-law, Ted Johnson, told me, he said, you know, John Carter is my father-in-law. And John participated in the writing of the first set of rules for ACHA. I said, wow, I'd like, and I did meet him at the UKC Winter Classic. They mm -hmm. were there mm -hmm. in Albany, Georgia. So I was able to arrange on one of my trips to go by there. They invited me to stay over. I stayed two days there with them and talked to Mr. Carter at length. Yeah. And he, he passed some, it wasn't very long after that, but he, his mind was very bright. And uh, we talked about that. And he talked about how the rules came to be, the problems they were having with subjective judging, where a, a judge went out and said, I like this dog best. Yeah. He's the winner. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and he said to me one thing I always remember. He said, when we came up with that system for the rules to determine who won the case, then we were on the right track. Yeah. It wasn't up to any handler or any one individual yeah. or whatever the rule what does the rule say yeah you know i think we're going to get to that a little you made yeah. some notes trevor about some of that you know how some of them uh you know how the first rules were you know just it was very subjective it was one one person's opinion 
well, really not a scoring system in place for it. It was more of subjective and right. and somebody's opinion of what was what was the best dog. But yeah. which was the best hunter? Which yeah. dog had the best yeah. mouth? Yeah. yeah, you know all those. You know, you, we go back to what we were talking about. You know that meeting that was held in uh, Tupelo, Mississippi, and I was just there just a, a, like two weeks ago, and yeah. and I thought we had already made some of these notes, you know, and. And when I was there, I was kind of, kind of thinking, well, I was there for a rules meeting of sorts, you know, it wasn't uh, uh, for one of our other segments, one of our Beagle programs, yeah. but I really thought a whole lot about that, you know, and you, you think, okay, here I am. See yeah, I would, I would have loved to, I don't know, just something about this. It would have just been neat to be, be a fly a, on a, the fly wall. On the wall right. Is right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. yeah. Just to listen to what they, what, you know. Their ideas and things they talked about. Well, as you get older, Alan, you'll find yourself, I'm sure, in YouTube, Trevor, as you see uh, uh, conversations online and stuff and guys, they're trying to be helpful and mm -hmm. they're trying to spread the history, but they're so far off the face. You know, you just want to, sometimes it's very frustrating, but yeah. you can't be a know-it-all. You yeah. can't, yeah. you know, but to... To actually have known some of these people, because you mentioned the 40s. I was born in 1946. That was a busy year then. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, and the Coonhound magazines were always in my in my home as yeah. a kid as I yeah. started reading. Yeah. But you know that was a that was a pretty busy time. You know yeah. we got our first UKC registered dog in 54. Wow. So but but then. To think about all these breeds coming in, all these associations being formed. Dr. Ed Furman was a busy guy. Yeah. He he was the president of UKC at that time. Yeah, and uh, and and especially by today's standards, things as far as bringing in new breeds, especially of like a like a like a like coonhounds or a group yeah. like that, yeah. you know, in the same group that that was a lot going on in a matter sure. of, of no time, but. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that meeting in Wycliffe uh, or Wycliffe, Kentucky, you know, but uh, they also had a wild coon hunt that happened there on that, uh, at that uh, place where, uh, uh, where you mentioned here, according to the ACHA website, that was con considered as the first uh, world championship. Yeah. That was in what, 47? 40, 40, uh, it says, it said 1946. Six? 46. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a dog named Kate today and Leroy Campbell, a red yeah. bone won that first yeah. hunt. And, and it, then, it's interesting about the Red Bones. We mentioned them earlier about the field trials. They were mm -hmm. very dominant in the field trials. And then when the UKC, I'm jumping ahead, I guess, but the first UKC night champion was, was a, Red a Red Bone. Bone. Yeah. You know, so it's that breed, you know, really was a for, in, in the forefront. Yeah. But going back to what you're saying about the 40, mid 40s there, the red bone, black and tan, and the English were the three breeds. Yeah. Until these others came along, mm -hmm. so I guess there was a lot of red dogs around. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And, and after that first one, there we uh, you talked about the one in Kentucky. There, there were a few other hunts in Columbus, Ohio, in 1947, and Jackson, Mississippi, in 1948. Yeah. And you talked about it a little bit, but there uh, there was a lot of issues with these first night hunts. You know, they were they were a step forward from the field trials. I think the hunters thought, but there were still some issues. Um, and, and the biggest issue was that there were no points or rules to base anything off of. Yeah. The non-hunting judge was going out there, usually with a cast of four dogs, similar to today, and without ever having heard these dogs, uh, yeah. trying to figure out which dog was the best. They've never laid, they never laid eye on these yeah, dogs. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. Can you imagine, so I'm judging a cast of dogs, and, and I'm a non-hunting judge, and what I say is going to go here, my opinion is mm -hmm. going to be best, but really think about it. If, if I'm, I'm hearing your dogs for the first time, I might not even know what I'm, whose dog it is. It takes, no. how long does it take to figure out whose dog is who and what dog is right. what? Right. And then I'm, I can't imagine if I'm going to no, really wow. do a good job of figuring out what the best dog is here. Yeah. And how do you have any, and, I don't, and maybe they hunted all night. I'm not sure how long they hunted here. Probably uh, at know. least three hours, maybe four. Yeah. yeah. You would think because the first night hunts, you know, were, were at least three, four hours long, you know, but yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, yeah, it's kind of mind blowing. And, can, and, and, and what if one of the handlers didn't agree, you know, we, 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 <laughs> we now have some pretty specific rules, you, you know, written they out. didn't and, agree? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and here it is wide open. This, that yeah. was, which, the fun, uh, funny image says right here that, uh, the biggest issue that came up of these first hunts is 
you couldn't get judges after the first few yeah. because they <laughs> they were just tired of, they beat of all them the down. backlash they got. <laughs> Probably yeah. a lot of one timers. Yeah, I yeah. One and done. <laughs> yeah. Not doing that again. Oh yeah. man. And, yeah. and to bring up Manfred Craver again, uh, there yeah. was a, a little bit of a write up that he made uh talking about uh an event that he attended at Leafy Oak National. And uh here's here's his quote here. It says my Lindy Flyer was in the final cast with another red bone and two walkers. There were no rules, no points. My red bone Lindy struck and trailed and tre- treed two coons by herself. One of the walkers was not in on the coon until after we were at the tree. He never opened on the track, and I'm not even sure if he even treed. The other two didn't come in at all. My red bone was nine years old and a reasonably close hunter, and the walker stayed out of sight. There were not other tracks struck, nothing else treed, and I lost. <laughs> The, ju- the judge oh, said well. he liked the way the walker got around through the woods better than mine did. <laughs> no other explanation was given. And can you imagine the guy saying, I'm good, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a pretty tough pill to swallow. It would be, uh, wouldn't it? Tree two coons, and, and yeah. just because another dog stayed out of sight a little more, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It'd be pretty tough. It, like, I guess, yeah. The thing Liked comes- how he barked around in there, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It comes to mind to me if you've it, uh, guys have ever been on a cast with somebody that absolutely did not know the rules at all, mm-hmm. a novice or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I can remember a situation back home at our club in West Virginia. A fellow was hunting in his first hunt, and his dog did tree a coon, but he never struck the dog. He never treated the dog. He didn't do anything in accordance with the rules, but his dog treated a coon. So he was highly irate that he didn't win the cast. <laughs> yeah. sure. And you tried to explain to them, this is why you didn't win. They don't want to hear that. Uh, the bottom line is my dog treat a coon, so therefore he's a winner. Yours didn't, uh, and therefore he's the loser. Uh, and what, where would we be without rules? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, speaking of rules, and right in during that time, 1948, here was that timeline. You mentioned Robert Graves from uh, Robert or Alexander City, Alabama, you know, met with a group of hunters in the area, and they started working on rules for a night hunting club. Yeah. You know, and he formed that, uh, he founded the East Alabama Night Hunters Association in 1949, Robert Graves. Yeah. There you, a name you hear over and over again, Robert Graves, Manfred Graver, uh, a couple of these guys. And we're fast forwarding to 1950, 51 here, and it says the East Alabama Club had just hosted an ex- a successful ACHA World Championship, and a group of men met at the cafe in Alexander City. Yep. Uh, four of those men in attendance are ones that we've talked about here. Uh, Robert Graves, Manfred Craver, you mentioned John Turner earlier, That's and right. Joe Jones. And uh, this meal mm-hmm. uh, with, these, with this group of individuals turned into what really became uh, the real first set of night hunt rules being put together and in place that would uh, that would feature hunts based on a set of rules that would be able to uh, evaluate dogs uh, subjectively with a points based scoring system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I remember, and I don't know if this is a misprint. It may not be. I don't. I'm not familiar with John Turner. The gentleman I knew was John Carter, oh. but he was part of that group. And there could have been a John Turner yeah. also. But I remember him saying distinctly. After they did that and they wrote these rules and all, then he said, we were on our way. Yeah. You know? The foundation they just, had they been just laid. knew this is what yeah. we've been needing all along. Yeah. Surely they would have taken some of their own dogs and tried those instead yeah. of just writing them out, right? Yeah, well, it, it you would kinda, think. Kinda says oh, they, they did. They yeah, tried yeah, them yeah. for sure. And they had, Mr. Carter told me that one of the guys, I think Robert Grace was the guy that was kind of the scribe. When they'd come up with these rules and everything, he was the guy that kind of put sense to it, put it on paper, made it yeah. work, mm-hmm. you know. And I did an article about this one time, and I don't know if you guys saw it, but it talked about how at that club they checked entries. Do you remember that? Yeah, Reading that? yeah I did. I thought that was yeah. interesting yeah. because they, uh, out of, I don't know how many, 60 entries, they had a guy at the club that could climb. Yeah, yeah. And most, no, they came up with like 60% of the den trees they made did not have a coon. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Us coon hunters do not want to hear that. No. <laughs> and there's another story about that. I don't know if you want to hear, but the club at Milstead, Illinois, one time conducted an in depth study mm-hmm. on weather conditions, wind, barometric pressure, moon, 
how many dogs were in the cast and all that. And, you know, so the clubs back in those early days were quite active mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, but anyway, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's just an aside there. I guess. Yeah. You know, so it, it notes here, you know, they worked on those, uh, worked on a new set of rules and, and everything to evaluate do dogs on a points based scoring system, you know, but they would implement a rule, then go to the field and hunt. Uh, to test and see if they needed modified and such. And then it goes on to say, you know, that in, in that fall or in the fall of that year, Robert then sent a copy of the rules they had compiled to Manfred Craver. There you go. Yep. Oh. Manfred. Says, yeah. uh, Manfred and Charles Nugent. That's Charlie name Nugent. That's yeah. Great guy, red bone guy. Yeah. Knew him back in the day. See, Char a, so did I. Now, this yeah. is kind of my, where, you know, Trevor and I were talking about when I saw this name, Charles Nugent, and I knew he was involved early on, but he was, he was a officer of the Red Bone Association. He was actually the one that really talked me into accepting a position in, as in office awesome. uh, as in the Red Bone Association. Yeah. And I didn't want to. I was pretty young at the time. I was in my mid-20s, and I felt I was too young. But I remember he took me off to the side. And he was also from Greencastle, I think, yeah, in that think area, so. Cloverdale yeah, yeah. or Greencastle. Mm -hmm. I forget his wife's name, but I still remember right. that where we were when he kind of took me off to the yeah, side and, and she encouraged was... me to, to, you know, to, to do it. But, yeah, that was Charles Nugent. Well, hats off to Charlie. Yeah, he well, did a good job. Well, yeah, I just uh, – <laughs> and he was he – was, I don't know how old he was, but I would say probably oh, yeah. in his 80s at that time already. Right. But, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Manford and Charles it says they took a couple weeks to go over that first set of rules. And uh, and really, they didn't make many changes, just some maybe some clarification, Steve, like you talked about. Sometimes it's good to do mm -hmm. some, yeah. a different set of eyes looking over something. Yeah. You're able to yeah. clarify mm -hmm. it. They were able to simplify it down and make it a little more uh, legible maybe for, for folks. And uh, that ver that first version of the rules that they kind of uh, made public, eleven rules featured five hundred and seventy three words on a on a, the back of an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper. The other side was uh, the the scorecard, and on the other side was the the rules. Like, Let's go to what back we have to today. those days. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I kind of uh, compared it to what the scorecard looks uh, looks oh. like this year. Our, yeah. We we have a new scorecard for uh, for twenty twenty three with our new rules that went into effect this this year. And uh, ours are now uh, 14 by 11 and uh, has just shy of 3,500 words on the back of it. So <laughs> yeah. there's wow. been some extra uh, yeah. ver verbiage uh, yeah. put on yeah. there. I uh, see. But, uh, but uh, let's see. This is, uh, there were immediate results as entries went up in earnest. And, uh, and of course, we talked about it earlier. Judges became a lot easier to find now that there were actually some <laughs> – some rules to go by and not yeah. just uh, yeah. a, a free yeah. for all. Yeah. Uh, but during these times, you know, we talked a lot about what was going on, on the on the ACHA side of it in these first night hunts. But uh, at this time, UKC wasn't just idle; they had kind of uh, uh, been tied with the National Cooners Association. And I tried to do some more studying on this online. I couldn't find much information on it. But during that time, uh, they they were involved with the NCA, as they called them, which was made up of an independent group of coon hunters. And, uh, and basically what UKC did for them was promote the NCA and their events mm -hmm. at donate free advertising. And, and in return, the NCA required that the dogs that competed in their events must be UKC registered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I could read that, you know, from that, all those, uh, resources that you mentioned before at UKC, when I was there, uh, you know, a lot of that history and you go back, there was quite a strong relationship there between this NCA and I'm not sure I don't remember who the principals were in that organization I don't know if Lester Nance was maybe involved in that a little bit it seems like maybe that. he was because I know he was like one of the real maybe we'll get to that but he was one of the guys that really pushed you know for for registration of the walker dog as mm. a tree walker right. but he also was an innovator with the bench shows he right? was he actually wrote the first set of bench show rules right. the standards basically and that show i believe was held at leafy oaks or at least yeah. the boy, or kenton yeah whatever yeah but those first NCAA nca events they they kind of got started up with an event they called the mayflower national that was in may of 1951 and you mentioned lester nance he actually won that first hunt with uh a tree and walker he named N and K Sparky. Sparky, yeah. Um, it was. Well, uh, oh, go ahead. No, uh, go ahead. I was just gonna say that the second one they had was just later that year in September in Arcadia, Indiana, one that they deemed uh, Tree and Walker Days, yeah. and uh, Lester Nance was the master of hounds at that one. But I couldn't figure out who won that event. There was no mention of who won it, but then it also mentioned the third event 
Uh, and the final one that it mentioned was uh, another Mayflower National the following May, in which the winner was again Sparky Lester Nance. Yeah. He, he doubled up on them there at the, the Mayflower <laughs> National. Yeah, you know, the only thing I was going to point out that kind of uh, kind of I noticed right away is you know Manfred Craver was uh, involved in writing kind of writing the rules, so. His dog was in contention to win at one of those first ones. Here you've got Lester Nance involved. He's also one oh, of the yeah. first ones. So yeah. It was, yeah. Well, those were the guys that were real serious about yeah. that. And and so many people weren't back in those days. Uh, you know, a lot of great dogs at the mm -hmm. hunts, non-registered dogs. And it took a while, you know, for UKC to convince these people that there was value in a registered dog, you know. But when those trophies started showing up and guys started going to these events and coming back, because back in the day, a 12-inch night hunt trophy won by your dog was a big deal. Right. right. It was a big deal. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, and then the magazines and so forth, the pictures would come out. And I said, it's a yeah. lot of pride. They, they a lot, had a of, lot pride. of pride in those days. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. It, Kind of during these same times, we keep mentioning the same people, but you can imagine uh, Dr. Uh, Furman in those days probably getting his ear bent quite often that, uh, you know, uh -huh. we have these associations now, you're, you're relying on NCA to put on these events, but uh, there was a lot of people that just wanted UKC to put on their own UKC yeah. last night, huh? and it mentioned people like the the usual suspects, Robert Graves, Manfred Craver, and there's some new names here, so I feel like we I should point them out real quick. We've got Robert Browning, Floyd Butler, Bryce Carnahan. Claude Philippi, I, I'm sorry, I may have uh, yeah, that's said that correct. Uh, Wayne Cox, Mark Decker, Roy DeLauder, Robert Everett, Homer Hill, Jim Ingham, Walter, Walter Roll, and Emerson Opdyke, uh, among some others. But that's a that's a big list of names there. Well, almost all of those names are people that I met personally wow. when I was young. Floyd so, Butler being one of them. Floyd Butler, he was the secretary of the eventually the ACHA, I believe, but he's the one that held that first event at in England, England yeah. Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, just past See, his, Robert Browning. Yeah, Robert was from in Ohio. Used to he be was a field a, rep as well. Uh, he was a uh, a black and tan mm -hmm. fancier. Uh, was very uh, had won Autumn Oaks, I think, the National Grand. With the Nash, uh, Claude Philippi was very active in the Treen Walker, that first Treen Walker Breeders uh, Association, along with Lester. Wayne Cox was a black and tan breeder from Maumee, Ohio. He was uh, very prominent. Uh, the Mark Decker, I don't remember exactly. Uh, Robert Everett, I remember him. Homer Hill. Well, Jim Ingram was a black and tan fancier. I remember him real. And Emerson Opdyke was also a very prominent person back in those early oh, days. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can't say I was bosom buddies with those guys, but I met them and shook their hand. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So that well, I still good. have in, the, in my uh, office or my desk, I have the, a copy of the first license that was issued to that club, the Ingram Club, uh, and it was Floyd Butler had signed off on that. <laughs> No, no, sir. No. Well, and, and, and they had some good points. I, I, they, they had a couple different points pointed out here as to why they wanted it. The first thing, um, they felt like with, with any, in, in a lot of these events, just any dogs could compete. Didn't have to be UKC registered. And it was causing to, uh, some poor breeding habits. People mm -hmm. were, uh, uh, breeding too loosely, maybe with uh, pointers, uh, bird dogs, beagles, mm -hmm. foxhounds, uh, get in a lot of different things out there. Um, and it was having, and, and uh, the, the biggest effect that a lot of people were seeing were in their, their breed of choice, uh, a lot of, like uh, red bone for, if, if you make a cross and it came out red, you'd be able to single register it as red bone. And there was a lot of different influences mm -hmm. in there. We talked about how dominant red bones were at, were at the time. And, and those influences probably <laughs> didn't help the breed that was already doing well. Maybe, I don't know, but they were seeing some negative effects from that. Uh, hunters wanted uh, night hunts by UKC where their hounds ancestors had, ancestors had already been uh, registered, some for almost 50 years at this point already. Uh, they wanted to compete against other purebred dogs, maybe other dogs of, of their breed, and they wanted the chance to, to earn points in championships and hunts, and I think those are all pretty fair points and, and mm -hmm. points of concern. Yeah. And that's what built 
UKC was, you know, out of that desire of those coon hunting hunters to have some kind of an organization, some kind of a source where they could get recognition. I long time ago said that I, if I had any epitaph on my tombstone, it would be recognition is the name of the game. Yeah. I think the guys have always wanted that recognition. That's what you guys do so well right here to be able on Sunday morning to walk up here in front of a crowd of my peers and all and say, man, I am the national champion. That's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than money. It's bigger than anything else. Yeah. So, so with all those people kind of, of in his ear, there were a lot of meetings going on through late 1952 and early 1953. And I think we're kind of getting towards the time frame now where, we're, we're just 70 years out now, so we're about to see some things happen now. And uh, and it, it talks about uh, some of the people who, ha who had the strongest urge and that uh, Dr. Furman uh, was really taking, uh, listening to a lot, and that's Robert Graves and Manfred Craver. And the things that they kept telling him is that you don't need to work, you, you know, you need to work on getting the events scheduled and everything, but you don't need to work on getting a whole nether set of rules. We already have those. Let's just use the ACHA rules. They're new to people anyways. If they have to learn a whole nether set, it's just going to cause issues. And it actually worked. The UKC decided to use that first set that had, had dropped for their own licensed events. Sure. Yeah. yeah. If it ain't broke, Yeah, and when we, when we look at those rules today, we think, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember there at the office, I'm sure you've seen it, we had out in the display case, uh, we had uh, had a, picture of that scorecard for a long time you oh, see yeah. the same pictures you see in the yeah. in the first hundred years of ukc right. that publication they put out mm -hmm. you know but it's uh sure yeah it's pretty interesting to uh to see some of those first rules yeah mm. uh, do, do we want to talk yeah. about the, the scorecard yeah. right now yeah i'm kind of looking at it here and it's it's completely i mean it, it's it's way different than the one you'd see today where basically you were just tallying striking tree points for whatever reason and scoring them based on what the dog does uh, there's a lot more that goes in consideration here. And instead of uh, kind of uh, 25, 50, 75, 100, there's a, yeah. it's a Obedience. kind of an accum accumulation of points yeah. by things that not only the dog does, but the handler does. Yeah, throughout so the what hunt. is that handler? Obedience in the handler. What is five I points I think it's there? the way the dog handled, you know, on leash. And did the dog come when the handler called mm -hmm. him? And, and, you know, or, well, you know, just basic. Yeah. fundamental yeah. obedience yeah yeah yeah, you yeah. And voice fact, hound or pardon? hound voice the voice they gauge the voice yeah. yeah yeah so the judge well there was a point system here of uh, of sorts where they would could i i don't know if the if the dog was an obedient handler in other words he he handled well i guess he got five points yeah but maybe if, what if he was so-so, did he get two points? <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't uh, know. You know I, I don't know. But, uh, but then it goes into. That's OB. where clarification of the rule. How many, how many words did they have? <laughs> yeah. Well, we already got, yeah. we got a question on the card. Let's take <laughs> yeah, it back we, to the master. Yes. <laughs> how well the fencing did they yeah, fencing, handle yeah. fences? Watering. Well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of cool things on here. Uh, yeah. You know, dogs got points based on a false trail, false tree, 15 points on babbling. You know, they got a certain amount of points for not only treeing, but holding the tree. Yeah. You know, that yeah. was a thing then. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a really neat scorecard. And I, I think probably whenever we post this, this podcast on our social media platforms, maybe we'll be able to, to post a picture of this old scorecard for people to reference and look at because it, it is really cool to see this. It yeah. would be a hoot to go out and try to conduct a cast under these rules. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> what you'd come up with. I don't know. It yeah. would be interesting. You know, I'm talking sure. about holding tree, which we still have that today, you know, but you just don't see that that much. Even, even I think from when I first started, you just don't see dogs leaving trees like you did back then. No. In, in today's fact, world. Yeah, that's part of the evolution of yeah. the dogs, you know, because back in the day, getting a tree dog that would stay treed was a big deal. Well, that's, you know, like my grandfather, he hunted with two dogs. One was basically a track dog and the other was a tree dog. Yeah. And uh, that was the case sure. a lot of times. Absolutely. You know, and going back... I, I, since my tenure at UKC, you know, I always like to listen to or ask the old guys, you know, what it was like back in the day as compared to the, today. And, and we won't get into that, you know, but, you know, a lot of them say they, you know, think they were better back then for whatever reason. But 
Uh, I, I remember I talked to uh, uh, John, or, uh, uh, Mr. Rafe, the English guy, John Rafe. John Rafe. And I remember it really kind of stuck to me what he talked about then. You know, he said it had huge numbers, but if you got to remember in those times with the huge numbers, having a dog that would stay tree and stay treed was huge back in those days because he said you would compete against dogs that might in a three hour hunt might never make a tree or stay ever trace stay treed. Yeah. Yeah. And to Pretty think, amazing. yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that was people that just enjoyed, uh, being out with the dogs right. apparently that would tolerate that kind of dog. Yeah. Oh, I would, I drive to a hunt somewhere knowing that I had that kind of dog. Yeah. Did I have hopes that he would learn from the other dog. Yeah. And my strange. grandfather passed away, you know, a good number of years ago. And I wish I could have that conversation with him today. You know, why, how, you know, one to one would run the track and another one to tree. You know, I, what happened to the, what happened to the track dog? What was it doing when the other one was treeing? Was it out looking for another track or was it just milling around or what did they do? You know? I yeah. Know. Yeah. But that, yeah, going back to this scorecard from the Ingraham, Illinois, 1953, that first wild coon hunt, that's a, uh, yeah. And then, you know, it does have the, it does have the, uh, the rules written on it as well. Our partners at Dogtra have just launched an exclusive program available only to active UKC competitors. So if you've competed any time this year or plan to compete in any future UKC events, you can qualify to receive exclusive benefits through Dogtra. Take advantage of this exclusive program and become a Dogtra competition field staff today. To sign up, visit dogtra.com forward slash Dogtra competition field staff. That's dogtra.com forward slash Dogtra competition field staff. All right, so let, middle of the year here, it looks like they're finally ready. June 6, 1953 was the first UKC licensed wild coon hunt that was held in Defiance, Ohio. But this one was more what we would call a pilot event now, uh, kind of testing the rules that were kind of temporary. Um, uh, and, but UKC points were awarded there, but uh, on, on kind of a pilot uh, level. And uh, the winning dog, Giles Tuck, a plot hound owned by Claire Giles of Springfield, Ohio, won that first uh, first trial uh, uh ukc licensed coonhound event yeah you know that that's kind of amazing to me uh back in those days and those early days the plot figured very prominently mm -hmm. and it was pretty amazing that they did because they weren't long out of the mountains of north Not carolina mm -hmm. when guys like dale brandenburger and all and different ones uh, uh mr Patton from iowa and all went and got these bear dogs out of the mountains and brought them to the Midwest and started hunting coons with them. Mm -hmm. But they did have a tree instinct, I guess. But then to think, you know, back then of red bones and plots, which now, you know, usually in sheer numbers, they're on the, on the bottom of the heap sure. as far as, you know, the other breeds. But yeah, absolutely. to me, that was pretty amazing that they, they figured that well, you know, early yeah. on. Yeah. And they weren't through yet, were they? They weren't. They weren't. <laughs> I do want to mention an excerpt from uh, the 1953 July-August issue of Bloodlines. Uh, they're talking about, there used to, it's, it looks like to me, looking at a couple of old, they used to kind of do a write-up with some of these first events, and it, and it kind of is cool to look at. And the, the little write-up with this event these points are scored on the basis of the dog to produce under actual hunting conditions out in the woods and fields. This is where real coon hounds are made and where they are judged on their ability as real trailers and tree dogs. They are on their own here. We do not see any whippets or greyhounds leading the pack by eyesight and noise. <laughs> no, it is here that blood, breeding, and training tell the story of the true hound. And I think it holds up today. You know, in some of the other programs and segments out there with different dog events, um, and I don't know which one specifically, I'm not going to call of any of them out, but, uh, coon hounds and the coon, I think a, a, a night hunt event, it stays pretty pure to what coon hunters want at the end of the day. And I think this, usually the scoring system, uh, in place usually figures out who the best coon hound, uh, was on that night. Obviously not hundred percent of the time, but I think the rules in place and the way it's set up, we usually get the best dog at the end of the night to figure out who had the best coon dog that night. Certainly designed for that to be the goal of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and again, you got to commend these guys for having that kind of vision mm -hmm. 
and a desire, you know, to, to let's do something that really tells us which, who had the best dog. Mm -hmm. You know, we like to brag and if the dog, our name's on the collar, then that makes it a special dog. But who really did have the best dog here? Well, the rules say that old Joe was the best dog. He treated two coons. The mm -hmm. other dogs only three. One. Yeah. You yeah know, Frank was just running before. around. Yeah. Running around out there. Yeah. Yeah. Day, yeah. You know? So, yeah. He might have, Frank, he might have barked more, but Flyer treed more coons. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Flyer would have been a winner with these rules. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then the big day happened. September 18th and 19th, 1953, the first official UKC license night hunt. Ingraham, Illinois, we talked about it a little bit. Uh, we've got the, you know, the scorecard they use there. You talk about having the, the license uh, yeah. there framed up at your desk. Uh, we got the results here in front of us. It happened. It finally happened. It says it was widely advertised. Yeah. Can and I mention I was seven years old? Seven years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's, uh, I'm not ashamed of my age. Yeah. I, I wish I were younger, but <laughs> I, I, I never really thought about that until lately. But man, I came along right when all those things really started yeah. popping. Yeah. You were born into it. You didn't yeah, have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, anyway, you guys mentioned Floyd Butler a little bit, but mm. he was a huge force in getting this hunt in Ingraham mm -hmm. and, uh, and, yeah, he should be commended for that. Putting on the first official UKC license night hunt over that weekend. 33 total entries that weekend. Um, and we got a list of, of 29 of them. We don't have all 33. Uh, but what I thought was interesting, and we talked about how the points were, it's kind of not uh, not kind of a cast score system, really, it, as much as it is an accumulation of points as you go based on, on mm -hmm. a bunch of different factors and variables. And uh, it would take the entire weekend into account. The winners from this first event, would have had to do good in both casts to win this entire mm -hmm. event. It took both nights into account. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting there, you know, that they was, uh, they hunted for three nights, you know, and it was that, uh, that's how they determined their winner and, and an accumulative score. And, and I'll, I'll plug this in. I, I pulled this, uh, we had like a, uh, I forget the little game we had for a youth national several years ago, where I used to kind of, before you came along, you know, this was one of my questions for, I had a choice of answers, you know, and, and, uh, you know, how many points the first dog score, or the winning dog scored at the first ever UKC hunt? Was it 225 or was it 450 or was it 675 or was it 3,850? <laughs> well, nobody got that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no but... A lot of points. <laughs> yeah. It is. That's a lot of points. You're alluding here to yeah. our first our first ever winner. Yeah. First place, champion yeah. Overbeck's Lucky. Yeah. Owned by Elwood Overbeck of Jackson, Mississippi. 3,850 points over yeah. the weekend. And second place, we might as well go ahead and say it before we look at the full results here. Brandenburger's Big Lucky, another plot hound. Two plots, first and second. Uh, Lucky was owned by Carl Brandenburger of Millstadt, Indiana. Had a total of 3,749, so it was pretty close. Pretty close, yeah, for yeah. three nights of hunting, you know. Yeah, yeah. actually Dale Brandenburger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but that, well, you know, um, Something a little aside here. Did you notice that both winners, the first two dogs, name were, were Lucky? <laughs> yeah, I guess I didn't notice that till right now. Wow. Uh, I guess that goes were away. pretty intuitive. They said, Let's lame this one Lucky. He's going to make the history books. <laughs> yeah, that would have been Dale Brandenburg. Yeah, Dale. Yeah, sorry and they were that. brothers. Carl and Dale yeah. were brothers. Sorry so you're that. close. Yeah. Yeah. Close. yeah. Uh, but a bunch of, it says the magazine, uh, a bunch of coonhound enthusiasts would be surprised at how many of the winners we would recognize from that first weekend. And just going through some of the top ten here, you know, we talked about uh, we talked about Elwood Overbeck. There's Dale Brandenburger, uh, James Merchants mentioned on here. There's Lester Nance, uh, Junior Gibson, Floyd Butler. A lot of names on here that uh, that would uh, be very historic in the history of, of coon hunting. Yeah, all sure. these were about two gener or good generation ahead of me. But I would have so loved to have hunted or competed against like guys like a james merchant they say he was just a fierce competitor oh yeah you mm -hmm. know and uh, that, well you and know maybe i wouldn't have liked james i don't know but... probably not because <laughs> james was very competitive you know and in the early days he was the guy one of those guys that kind of grasped the bull by the horns and said this is a game you know that i'm going to play with gusto yeah. you know and he has a dog that ends up winning 
that other world but you there was no ukc world championship at that yeah. time you know right. and mm -hmm. so he won the hca world championship three times in four years with wow. a, a dog mm -hmm. called merchants bali so you know that spark that created a spark in a lot of guys that wanted to do that mm -hmm. you know and a yeah. couple couple uh, uh just looking at the breed breakdown from this first event it kind of I got a good chuckle looking at it here. The the leading breed, so only 29 of the 33 are listed, but I think we can paint a pretty good picture of what it looked like at the event. Eight red dogs, they led the way. Uh, second was black and tans with seven. Six blue ticks were in attendance. Four English hounds. Two tree and walkers, only two tree and walkers, and two plots, it says. First wow. and second. They did pretty good. Yeah. They did. The <laughs> few, the proud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, you know, before registration, the walkers were not, you know, they were foxhounds, basically. Mm -hmm. They you were. Know, they were. And it wasn't long after, you know, uh, Motley in Missouri was one of the innovators and Lester Nance and those guys. And they came along with, they had these dogs that would tree and, and they started to breed them, you know, but. That pendulum really swung yeah. far yeah. to the right or left, whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not long after this, uh, we, you guys, kind of, or Steve, you kind of alluded to the, the rules committee and, and kind of how that came about. But uh, uh, Manfred Craver, again, is a, is a name that's credited with orchestrating the first rules committee. And uh, it, it makes good sense. You know, we, we wanted to have something put together to get input from the hunters that are competing out in, in these hunts. Uh, you know, I say it all the time when people are talking about uh, uh, rule input and say, well, why doesn't UKC just change the rule if they think it should be like that that way? We like to give the hunters that are out at competing in it. I can't remember the last time I competed in a night hunt. You're out there actively competing in the hunt. What are you seeing? I'd like to hear some firsthand yeah. feedback on mm -hmm. on that. And, and Manfred was probably ahead of his time in thinking that way, that right. the hunters should have a huge say in it because they're the ones out actively competing in it. And uh, the but those first uh, those first committees gave those first committees gave the hunters that opportunity, and uh, they're pretty similar to how we were today. The first ones I hear are from reading were maybe a little more chaotic than the the <laughs> ones that I've been able to sit in on yeah. because there was uh, basically uh, any any breed association can send any amount of of folks to those committees <laughs> and uh, kind of turned into a, a shouting a matches or all. Yeah. different things, but. Well, as you're talking there and you mentioned Manford and having remembered Manford about the, the man, I think of words, uh, organization, absolutely. A very organized individual. Uh, integrity, I think, without question. Uh, presentation, you know, he wanted it done right and how it was presented was very important. So, you know, our sport it's very fortunate to have leaders like that. I'm thinking back, this goes way back to the framers of the articles of government that we sure. live under today in mm -hmm. our country. Where would we be without the Thomas Jeffersons and the Benjamin Franklins mm -hmm. and all those people that were great orators, but they yeah. were great thinkers. And, yeah. and, you know, uh, I think it was Franklin or maybe that said, you know, here's the document. But you'll lose it if you don't take care of it. Yeah. Well, I think that's the way these guys were, yeah. and I I can speak for for uh, you know Manford. He was definitely that kind yeah. of guy. Yeah. yeah. I think it takes a special kind of person, and I tell I I don't know if I um there's a there's a lot of people that can uh, see that something's wrong and think that something needs to be done or changed or improved, mm. but it takes a special person to come and tell you how to improve it or have some yeah. some special ideas on how to and not be afraid to put their opinion out there and not be afraid mm -hmm. for people to scoff at it or, or maybe shoot it down at right. first. But uh, during this time, we've mentioned a lot, a lot of people who, who aren't afraid to kind of put their neck out there and have some inventive ideas, and look what it's led to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. you mentioned a great point, and I'm going to assume your roles, guys. At, when you interpret the rules— don't you feel a great responsibility oh. of saying, look, you know, you get that letter or email or that phone call and you're the guy that needs to, to say thus and so. Okay. 
there's a lot of responsibility with that because I don't want to put something out there that 10 guys are coming right back. But Steve, you missed it because it's this right. and it's that and it's right. that. And you didn't think about this or that. Right. So there's a lot of introspective thinking and I, you guys' heads are nodding. Yeah, I you know you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, we and talk, I, we talk about that a lot. We do. Yeah. Yeah. We do. And I, I think the average guy out there, as I say at the forks of the creek, probably doesn't think about that a lot. Yeah. You know, they say, well, they want the answer, right. you know, but those answers are, there's a lot of thought that goes into those answers. Yeah. And, and I think that's exact. And Manford, would be guy if you had 10 guys in a room you'd probably pick manford to be the guy that thought most about that and and put the most thought into yeah. his answer mm -hmm. right you know so yeah mm -hmm. yeah no you're 100 percent right about that and, and we do talk about that a whole lot yeah. today still and it is it is highly very important yeah it's sure is. It, i i get a lot of i get a obviously we, we just get a lot of rules questions it's probably always been like that but even today, I, even I, I like to just take my time when answering them because you're right, and giving an official interpretation is it's a lot of pressure when you're writing the Coonhound Advisor column. And you know, it's an extension of the rule book. Every month, you have to write an extension of the rule book. That's a, a lot of pressure to make sure you don't mess up. And, and I go over that with Alan. We have a lot of in-depth in depth discussions on uh, on different rules and, and how people could interpret them and, and look back at past uh, articles and, and advisor columns and everything. And we've mm -hmm. had some pretty lengthy discussions on mm -hmm. different rules and, and yeah. the consequences that can come from just mm -hmm. making one wrong interpretation. Yeah. Yep. You know, we're, we might be kind of be jumping the gun here when we talk about that. But another thing I find interesting is going back and reading some of those, those rule interpretations and some of the, a lot of the rules from way back and what they wrote and how many of those are still, we still have that same, exact rule and the interpretation has remained for all these years yeah i find that very interesting but yeah, i'm kind of jumping the gun here i nope. guess but uh no. we're talking about rules i love talking about rules though <laughs> well i think we're we're all mm. rules junkies yeah. you know i'm a rules animal yeah. yeah when people say oh well what difference does it make i said the rule says yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know and yeah. that it, it's the rule mm -hmm. i yeah. mean why do we have rules exactly. if we're yeah. not going to follow them? Mm -hmm. And so I've always been a very rules oriented yeah. guy and, and me maybe too. to a fault, but I'm, you know, and, and thinking the, the occupation that you've had and you have as well, Alan, it's uh, you have to be, mm -hmm. you have to be. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it, uh, I guess we, we can kind of wrap up that there. I mean, the, we, we were talking about the, the rules committees, the early ones. And, and of course, uh, being as they were, they kind of, uh, made some changes and they the rules committee not long afterwards looked a lot like they did today where only the chartered breed associations were in attendance only two members per association was uh was allowed in and uh and that's how we still do it to this day it, it is the mm -hmm. same as we did it last mm -hmm. year uh, yeah. right over there in the uh, expo halls so. yeah 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 but yeah. you know as as much as as things have changed you know i i we've talked about a lot we gave a lot of uh of credit to the folks back there that did it. And I'm just trying to think of what it would be like today if there wasn't those people who were progressive in their thoughts, like we've talked about, mm -hmm. you know, as of 2022, so uh, the 2022 stats, uh, UKC has 1,084 active coonhound clubs today. Um, and we had over 7,000 licensed night hunts last year in 2022. Mm -hmm. And uh, it all started back in, back in the, the mid forties into early uh, the 1950s and eventually 1953, whenever those first official UKC license night hunts took place. And I was trying to think back. I, I didn't want to, I, I put this in here, but 70 years. Wow. It's kind of, I was trying to put that into perspective for myself because I'm born in 90. So I'm still in the mindset <laughs> like that that's real close, but it's not anymore. Yeah. That's, that's 33 years back. But so 1953, we're 70 years from there. Where would we be another 70 years? It'd be the year 2093. So that, that, yeah, that you, kind of puts it into perspective. Yeah, I know it does, you know. <laughs> we'll be coming up on the I millennium. Don't think, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll make the next yeah. 70. Uh, Those guys might that be talking my... about that guy named Steve Field. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, absolutely. They and I've heard my grandpa talking about him. <laughs> absolutely. They I always said, you know, as I worked down through the years, Sometimes you're so busy and you think you have so much responsibility and everything. And 
And, you know, pride can enter in a little bit. Oh, they're going to miss me when I'm gone. Yeah. And say, no, in two weeks. <laughs> Who was that bald-headed guy that used to <laughs> be down there in that office in the corner? Who, who was yeah. he? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we certainly, uh, like, like you mentioned here in your notes, we certainly owe those pioneers a lot, you oh, know, pioneers yeah. of this night hunt game, you know. And, yeah. And uh, it's 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 interesting to go back and kind of look at the history of some of that stuff, how it all came about, you know, yeah. but, uh, and then there's a whole lot more that has transpired, you know, since then, you know, you were involved in a lot of that, you know, but you also have some fun quotes here. I thought they were pretty interesting. We got to yeah. read those, you know, Fred Moran, you know, we all know Fred <laughs> Moran, you know, and, it, and I'll just say, we're sitting here recording this at Autumn Oak. So this is the first year that we didn't actually put an application in the Mac Coon on Bloodlines for an entry. I don't know if you noticed that or not, I, Steve. I did not. Uh, uh, but we did get one mailed in entry and that was from Mr. Fred Moran. Fred, he didn't I'll know what to do. It. He didn't know how else to enter. He, he just refuses to let he, go. He, of this he wrote it up on a sheet of paper and he mailed it yeah. in. We got his dog entered. Oh, yeah, we did. Awesome. <laughs> no, but so one of the quotes is from Fred Moran here that we have here. And he says, the first hunt I ever went to was in Prospect, Pennsylvania, 1957. They had 12 registered dogs and 47 or 46 grade dogs. Times sure have changed. Yeah, they have. Absolutely. And I, then, oh, go ahead. No, go no, ahead, I, I would just uh, to put a punctuation mark on that. I looked at the crowd here today or tonight. You had over with altogether over 500 entries on Friday night. Fred remembers back in 57, they had 12 registered dogs. Yeah, 12 registered dogs. <laughs> yep. That's a long way. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So. I have another point where you can compare the two, you talked about them being happy with a 12-inch trophy. The the winner this weekend is going to end up with an Owens dog box, a thermal imaging monocular, a dog trip pathfinder too. And, uh, and who would have known all that stuff would have came about over the past 70 years. Yeah. My, My goodness, goodness, what that looks like now yeah. compared to them. But there was another fun, uh, a fun, uh, quote here and, uh, and kind of just, it, it kind of puts into perspective how far the tree and Walker breed has came in these years since its infancy back in the early fifties to where it is now, where it, kind of uh, dominates the competition scene on, on the night hunt side at least and it says uh, and this was this was not an article by a competing breed this is what uh, at the end of the magazine what the tree and walker association put it back there in regards to these first couple night hunts and that was in what in like 50, 1953 bloodlines right? yeah november yeah. december 1953 bloodlines it says the walker breed is rather slow to pick up we all hope to see this breed make progress in 1954 <laughs> The breed is held back by a few, and this always places a limit on any breed. However, the change will soon be cut, and the breed will come out from under the thumb and go ahead on its own merits. At least this is the report given to me at a recent meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so I am hopeful. Yeah. yeah. How, how about that? Well, yeah. you know, back in the day, people kind of expressed their thoughts in the writing, in the magazines, and in the articles, you know, and... It was like almost like a letter from back home. Somebody, you know, they kind of had that way of explaining things. But so if you were writing in a magazine, you just kind of wrote what you thought about mm -hmm. it. And people chose to either accept or not, you sure. know, that. But, uh, yeah, you know, we've, uh, we kind of covered the, the history of it, you know, the early days of it, you know, and there's a whole lot in between then and now, you know, that's happened. We're not going to, we could spend another two, three hours talking sure. about all that stuff, you know, but, uh, you know, then Fred comes along and there's that, this thing called the tournament of champions, the TOC, you know, that turned yeah. into being the world championship, right. you know, there's just a whole lot of history there. And eventually the winter classic, which you were a big part of that. Yeah, and can you can you speak on that a little bit while we have you here? What was that yeah. like uh, getting that? Uh, what was the, what was all the idea and the thought process well, of a winter classic? Well, as you know, the, that of course you're very much involved now with the Grand American, mm -hmm. but back in the day, that um, I don't know if that started out as an ACHA event. I believe it did, uh, and they also had yeah, and there were the. Uh, group of hunters in Ohio and so forth and all these people, they kind of worked it out after a while that they had an ACHA event one night and a UKC event the next night. Right. 
And uh, that went along fairly well until you mentioned Fred Miller. And Fred was a was a guy that, you know, he, he wanted the best for UKC. And, and so he basically gave them an ultimatum that either it's going to be UKC both nights or no nights. No, nothing. <laughs> and people, when you back them into a corner, they don't have anywhere to go but overtop you. <laughs> and so they yeah. said, okay, bye. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be... So for several years, it was like an ACHA hunt. And then as history, the story, AKC bought ACHA. Mm -hmm. The ACHA board and AKC didn't get along. They split ways. They, there was still an ACHA hunts, but no registry. And there's all that whole history there. But uh, it came back around, you know, to be a UKC in, in time. But... We, during that time that it was being run by another registry, we knew how successful the Grand American was, and we wanted to have a UKC presence in the, in the Southeast, mm -hmm. which is a very strong coon hunting area, you know? So we talked about that, and the idea was that we were going to put on, we didn't want to compete on the same weekend, but we were going to put an event for our people, mm -hmm. our UKC people down in the south so and i've mentioned this several times fred miller and i were on nine airplanes in two days looking at fairgrounds okay i can remember we went to macon georgia we went to perry georgia the big fairgrounds a great big oh huge, a, huge huge thing yeah but they wanted us, everybody to park out in the parking lot and walk in to the fairgrounds you know coon hunters like to park around mm tie their dogs on the tailgate. You're not going to go inside that big ag center and leave your dog two acres back here right. tied right. In a, or in a dog. Bus. So we knew that wouldn't work. We went over by, we flew into Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and I think we looked at something right on the coast around Charleston, mm -hmm. looked at that, and there was a blue tick guy that was pretty popular. Back at that time, he was a major in the army, John Falcon, and he had a dog called Southern Blue Pride that he offered at stud. And he was very helpful to us in finding the Albany, Georgia location. He set it up with a, a lady named Becky Salimi, who ran, was the president of the, or the representative for the Chamber of Commerce in Albany. And he, he told us, you know, this is, this is the place you need to go. Of course, mm -hmm. He he was being a, a bit self-serving because that's where he lived down in that area, and he wanted it to come there, mm -hmm. no problem. But anyway, I remember very well we flew in. Uh, don't I think we flew into Tallahassee? I think would have been maybe right into Albany at that time. Becky put us in the car and we drove out to the South Daughtry Daughtry Community Center which is south of Albany. You go down, the, the, go, the famous golfer Bobby Jones mm -hmm. had a house there on the corner. And you turned there and you went down a couple miles of water and we turned into this tree-lined drive. And it's if you look at the old ads for the Winter Classic, yeah. you'll see this classic coon hunt in the old south, mm -hmm. okay? And you'll see these moss-draped yeah. trees. Well, when we turned down that driveway, Fred's eyes lit up like a Christmas tree. He said, this is the spot. Yeah. yeah. And so, but it was a community center. And I remember very well in, in the heat of that, uh, you know, of course it was January, but we walked off all those vendor spot areas, sprayed them with spray paint because it was just grass. There was no buildings except the clubhouse itself, which was a typical... It looked kind of like a, a country club clubhouse. Hmm. And they had banquets in there and stuff. And they, I remember the first year we had waiters with black pants and white jackets and towels over there. Uh, over there you know, but that was all done by the Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. See? So we had to rent a circus tent to hold our, our bench show and, we, and to, to do, call our entries and all of that. So we stayed there three years, but we realized that 
that event was getting much too large. And we didn't know whether anybody would come. And I remember having those butterflies, you know, and that first day, boy, they started rolling in there. And, uh, you know, and it just each year, it just, yeah. just kept growing. And then we uh, got acquainted with the, the uh, through the Chamber of Commerce again, the Exchange Club of Albany uh, there. And they wanted to, they ran the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. And that's how we moved there. And it was there several years. And it years. has one of it those same big trees out there. And then when you pull into that driveway yeah, as well yeah, on that exactly. fairgrounds. Yeah. 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 I remember that's one of the first thing I noticed, that mossy tree when you yeah. old mossy uh -huh. moss hanging off that but tree. But that when became you an instant success, really. Yeah. I mean, guys, it, and it provided the perfect getaway for yeah. people in the wintertime. It was. You know. Trevor, did you ever go to that one in Albany? No, I never, never did. Adult. Yeah. That was, mm -hmm. that, was, uh, that was a good yeah, one. Yeah. And, of course, you got a terrific facility now in Batesville yeah. well I was going for that time it w it was yeah. a good facility yeah. you know you know and then you kind of mention you say mention a lot of things it was kind of the same here I come along and I you know you felt or saw the need for one you know but yeah. I remember in 2008 you know things kind of crashed you know the economy was not good that in a was good not place. a good year 2008 you know we, we you mentioned the Grand American and then we also had southeastern tree walker days you know was at the end of February Grand American happens the first of January, right? Uh, and we had the the Winter Classic that you're talking about it was the end of January, right. and then Super the, Bowl weekend yeah, every time yeah, yeah. we'd fly back to Kalamazoo, and the pilot would be <laughs> yeah. relaying the scores over yeah. the intercom. You yeah. know, miss the Super Bowl every year, <laughs> and then uh, 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 Southeastern Tree Walker Days there in February. And then we've got the economy is just not in a good place at the time. And people really started picking and choosing, you know, Grand American uh, mm -hmm. Winter Classic Which or uh, mm -hmm. Salisbury, you know, or Southeastern. And uh, that's kind of what, you know, that's yeah. what I said when I came along, you know, we were, we thought, you know, us being in the middle, we don't really have anything in the Southwest. You know, you're talking about you needed something in the Southeast when I, during that time, I'm thinking, you know, kind of have this issue here people are picking and choosing and it kind of makes sense for we don't have anything in the southwest so yeah here i come along and, and here again you know you remember those days when we moved it was very successful or oh, highly yeah. successful and yeah. that was a big deal to me and it was you were apprehensive you know that's a big move taking something that had been there for 25 years at this point yeah. mm -hmm. you know and then and but we did a lot of the same things. I made a couple trips, you know, one time by myself and maybe with one of the others. And later on, Todd and I made another trip to look at several locations in the further west, southwest, you know, and and, uh, and we yeah. eventually landed in, in Batesville, you know. Yeah. But that was, you know, it was a huge change, you know, and we oh, took yeah. a lot of criticism over it. But it was the same way for me. You know, you, you're messing with an event that was so successful for so long and you make such a big move. That's, that's, yeah. you don't, you think on paper it might look good, but that yeah. was, that was a big yeah. Yeah. move for well, me it's too. It's a leap of faith. It is, you yeah. know, and then you mentioned, you know, to, to see the people come in and it's, you know, it being what it is, oh, yeah. kind of went through a lot of the same things, I, didn't I think. I did get to go to that first one in Batesville, but I saw the pictures that came forth and all that and that were taken from up on the mezzanine level or whatever. And yeah. I said, Gee, this yeah. is, this is nice. Yeah. You can see all your vendors in one yeah. spot and and your show and everything yeah. all together and it, it's a good move, no doubt. Yeah, you know, but so I think there's a lot of things we talked about a lot the evolution of a lot of things, how things of there's the more they stay the you know, the more they change, the more they kinda still stay the same, but it's it it's you know, it's kinda neat to watch the evolution of things, you know, from mm -hmm. talking all the way back to the to the forties and fifties, you know, and those and where we are today, you know, we kind of skipped over the, the this event where we're sitting here recording Autumn Oaks, you know, 1960, you know, and yeah. I'm sure you talked a little bit about it in oh, the yeah. onset, you know, mm -hmm. some of your experiences, but uh, where it is now, you know, and then and we mentioned the TOC became the world championship. Now we also have the Tournament the of Champions champion. that we kind of stole that name from Fred Miller back in the day. It's a good and name. It's, it uh and yours it, was a it, lot more successful than his was <laughs> i don't know but it's uh you know there's just another evolution of that that's uh really mm -hmm. come a long ways so yeah 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 well i think like we talked about it takes uh people who aren't who aren't afraid to take risk and that's how we've progressed the sport to where we are today and uh 
uh, still going 70 years later. UKC events were still going strong here in, in Richmond, Indiana at, at yeah. 60. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the crowds are, are, you know, every year since COVID that, yeah, yeah right. They're, they're, they're larger and larger. Yeah. And there's yeah. been a lot of carbon life forms yeah. on this fairgrounds this, today. Yeah. I've been out coming, there coming so, walking around. I have a question for you, Steve. I, I know we'll probably wrap this up here in a minute, but I have a question for you. In your tenure at UKC, what would you feel like? I'm sure you have something. What What do you consider as your biggest accomplishments in terms of of being um, uh, in terms of being involved in the sport and the betterment of the sport or improving on the sport? Did you, well, do, do you have something? I do. I think, you know, immediately I think of the growth and success of Coonhound Bloodlines magazine during that period of time where huge, when I came huge in. Huge, during that yes, time. When, when I came in, and I don't take all the credit for this, but I, I was fortunate to be able to play a part. You know, we had 3,000 subscribers when the other two Coonhound magazines had about – Cooner had 29,000, Fulker had 30. I looked at those numbers a lot, you know, and to see how we were able to grow Coonhound Bloodlines. That was a very, and I ultimately, you know, became the editor. Right. My favorite job was your job, being in the field office. I loved that most. But that was great. I see the Winter Classic as an, an important milestone. I see... And it didn't carry through, but one of the things that I was really fond of and enjoyed a lot was the American Heritage Hunt when mm -hmm. we did that with the Western theme and the rodeo parade and all of that. Those are very fond memories for me. And I think the very first UKC World Championship bench show up in your neck of the woods at Columbia City, Indiana in 1985, right. that that was a, a big rush for me yeah yeah uh, so yeah and and to see the rqes progress because back in the day we started a century club where if if a field rep entered a hundred dogs or more in an rqe yeah he got a plaque and we did a right. presentation at the world hunt and that there would, there would be a dozen or more of those given yeah. away every yeah. year you know yeah. so those are fond memories i don't think i could say a, a major accomplishment except that you know, I think the PR effort really improved at, at at UKC during that time because Dr. Furman was more of a kind of back in the in the in the um, in the background kind of guy, really, mm -hmm. in in the crowds and all, untouchable kind of. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of the opposite so, of Fred was kind of the opposite of that. Yeah, probably. Fred always, you know. From the get-go, he was at every breed association, meet, association meeting and all that. I felt I used to feel a little self-conscious because he'd make me go right into those board meetings. I said, those guys don't want to. In fact, it was my association, the plot association. They said, no, nobody's going to be in here but our directors. <laughs> and there was a pushback <laughs> on that. Yeah. But that's a tough one, uh, Alan. I can only say. All my years at UKC were enjoyable. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they really were. Um, you know, when you get into the push and shove of daily life, you know, it, it can get tedious at times. Sure. But I was always very proud to be part of UKC. Mm -hmm. And I'm still proud to be able to come here and to, that you guys let me sit down with you and talk about that. But I, I can't name what I would think it's a major accomplishment I do appreciate the growth of the world hunt i never thought about anything like really like you did with the tournament champions which that's a home run i wish i'd had that idea i didn't but uh had some pretty good ideas along yeah. the road and and we saw some real growth you know uh i mean if you look back at the old world hunt where we'd have a hundred entries total or qualified mm -hmm. and then we'd have you know that it grew exponentially you know through those years right but um those are all just fond memories yeah. for me for an old guy but but uh i don't know the one single thing i would think oh uh, i would think either the winter classic or to see these bench shows how they have grown yeah and see how many people the 
ladies and, and young people especially that enjoy them. To me, that's a great sense of pride to me. We, did, we didn't touch on that. We should have a little bit, I feel like, because even, even you know, 40 years ago, uh, you're talking about Ben shows, 40 years ago, it was a lot of the same men we have talked about yeah. were showing those coonons they were That's hunting. Right. And at some point that kind of evolved even here at Autumn Oaks, you know, they had the one long bench yeah. uh, and <laughs> to get the, to get the whole family involved, you know, mm -hmm. where, where some of the women folks started taking an interest in, in, yeah. in showing the dogs and that yeah. has totally flip flop. You know, well, nowadays you see, and there's still a lot of men still showing dogs, you know, yeah. of course, you know, but, uh, there's a whole lot more women involved in the sport as well. Oh, absolutely. And that's very, very, very And bench shows are a big part yeah. of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, little things that I'll look back when I'm too old to come to Autumn Oaks and say, I was there when the individual show benches came in and yeah. you mentioned the yeah. long ones, yeah. you know? that and i was there when we did away with the uh convoys yeah and they no longer yeah. had to drive 80 trucks see trevor you probably you probably <laughs> i can't. never attended yeah. yeah yeah so and those little milestones yeah. along the way you know were kind of i remember kinda the 50th autumn oaks uh, one of the meetings i was kind of trying to push a little bit for some of that to have to bring up bring the long benches back for the 50th autumn oaks and it seemed like everybody thought it was a good idea that may not work that well. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, the maybe the hunter or the, right. the bench show folks right. might just not get it, you know. And well, one thing you did that I don't like, and I might as well say it <laughs> yeah. publicly, you got rid of the kitchen in this building, and I can't get a pork chop sandwich. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, got Other to than it. that, I'm, I'm pretty yeah. happy. Well, with old been. Benny Green, he, he was having a hard time getting all the help he needed in there. Yeah. But you know, it, you know, a lot of things, a, a lot of things have changed, and sometimes you think, I don't know. Sometimes I think there's things that worked, you know, twenty, thirty years ago that just don't work they anymore today. Work today. That's and sometimes true. vice versa. Some things that, uh, sometimes some things that didn't work 10 years ago, they work now. Well, this, you know, yeah. it's, it, but it's interesting I, how things yeah. kind of happen like that or work I, out like that. Yeah. There's a discussion nationally about history and how is it important or should we just destroy our history and forget about it and, and go, no, we learn from that history. That's why I've always loved history. Yeah. I love to look back. I love the old things. I love log cabins. I love old yep. spinning wheels and yep. plows uh, and, and all those things. But the things what we learned, do we want to go back to that? No. But it's important to know how those people got things done and they had a work ethic and they had they were innovative and they thought yeah. they were thinkers and all that. And and that applies still today. I don't think that will ever get old. I really don't. Yeah, you know, it. It's. I feel like I'm. I kind of came along in kind of a in between, if you will, in between era, so to speak. You know, well, now here we get Trevor comes comes along, and and I see him doing good things at UKC. And one of the things that he has brought, as from the younger generation, I feel like is just, uh, you know, the uh, the internet. You know, and, yeah. and and posting things. You know, and and taking advantage of some of those platforms and do them as well as he does, you know, to get information sure. out to the masses, you know. and Vitally and, important today. Yeah. Absolutely. And good, yeah, it's just yeah. A, a different, you know, and yeah. it's, a, yeah, but it's good good conversation. Yeah, good conversation. I really enjoyed it. And we talked a lot about uh, a lot of people who had major influences on coon hunting and progressing it through the years, and I think uh, – I think both of you guys will be uh, mentioned in that conversation as the years progress. You guys have both had major impacts. You're both too humble when you're here talking about it, and, and but you guys have both had major impacts on a lot of hunters' lives, mm -hmm. um, and still got a long ways to go. And uh, I've, I've, I feel uh, blessed. It's humbling sitting here with two guys who are so well respected in the sport, and I appreciate the opportunity to sit down with both of you. I hope you both know that. So. Well, I do, great. and and that comes right back at you, fella. Because when For I look sure. at young, young, sure. guy, young guys, I can't talk. Young guys like yourself that are so bright and so full of energy and so, you know, articulate and all that. I feel very comfortable to know that the sport I've loved all my life, virtually all well, my life, is a real good hand. Well, I think you can probably relate, Steve, you know, to having been so involved and directly involved, you know, like I have also been 
that it, it is important for us, for, for those that come behind us to have that same passion for it and mm -hmm. that they, you know, that they, Oh yeah. I know, hope that they will. You're right. I hope right. that they really feel when they come through this door, this is my place. Yeah. You know, I, I, I belong here. Mm -hmm. You know, this, these are my peeps, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and I, I love it, you know, and yeah. I do. And, 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 the and not just us, you know, there's a whole lot of folks behind the scenes, hunters. And we talked about oh, the James yeah. Merchants, the Manfred Cravers, you know, and the Robert Graves and, and all those. There's a whole lot of those folks out there still today, even though they might not sit in our seats, but they're a very influential sure, part of absolutely. the evolution of this sport. I used to try at times when I was still involved in standing before a crowd of hunters before event and i i would try without being mushy about it i try to say to those guys hey i owe so very much to you guys that's you know yeah i own my livelihood for all those years my son was educated by coon hunters by their contributions to to you know our company uh you know so many things in my life i would not have experienced uh, you know, financially and uh, mentally and, and mm -hmm. socially and all that, that I owe to those guys that were sitting on these bleachers today, That's right. yeah. you know, and I've always felt that very strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, not always, they probably didn't always when things didn't go just exactly the way they wanted it. And I had to bow up a little bit and say, well, it's chapter and verse boys. <laughs> this is yeah. what the rules say. Yeah. But still, down deep in my heart, I was very, very grateful for yeah. the opportunity. So I, yeah. I know you guys feel that, too. Well, I certainly do. You know, and I know we uh, the old guys talk about the good old days, and I have yeah. my good old days as well, you know. But I'm sure just like here at Autumn Oaks, there's some, some of those folks that raised their hand today that said it's their first time at Autumn yeah. Oaks, you know. These are the good old days for some of those folks, yeah. too, in the younger crowd, too, you know. Yeah. So. I talk to people on the West Coast and all that are dream is to get out here. Yeah. And they'd say, well, the the duties of life right now, kids, and school, yada, yada, can't make it right now. But my goal is to come to Automotive. Yeah. So. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, guys, I think that's a, probably a good place to leave it here. We got uh, 8 o'clock here. A lot of the people are coming back to meet their guides and judges here at the table. And, uh, yeah. man, I can't thank you guys enough for sitting in. Steve, thank you for, uh, thank for you staying so late for today and talking to me, me and Alan. Uh, yeah. It was a great conversation. Uh, all the listeners out there, I hope you enjoyed this look back in the history to see where all this night hunt stuff started. And uh, can't wait to see where it progresses through the years. Here's to another 70 years, huh? There you go. <laughs> thank you, Steve. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to give us a follow so you don't miss any of our new episodes or content.